Hey, I'm Alex McKenzie, curator here at Springfield Armory National Historic Site. You want to tell us a little more about the museum? Sure. Uh, Springfield Armory National Historic Site commemorates uh, the historic Springfield Armory, which functioned as a government uh, arms factory from 1794 until 1968. Okay, and the, the collections here, it looks like both equipment used to make firearms and then firearms themselves. That's right. Uh, we kind of divide it into two sections, uh, the public museum. Uh, one side is more the how mm -hmm. uh, and uh, where we feature a lot of the early machinery and talk about the process. One of the really important things about Springfield Armory is when it started, factories didn't exist yet. So really they had to scale up cap craft production and create factories out of nothing. And part of that was trying to figure out how to get towards mass production mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, how the how the how mm -hmm. <laughs> evolved uh, in the quest for interchangeable parts. Really. And so the armory opened when? The armory uh, uh, has its roots during the American Revolution. Uh, when this area was selected by uh, Henry Knox and uh, George Washington to be a basically an ordnance depot. Uh, and uh, so all sorts of stuff was some, uh, stored here, cannon, artillery, you know, uh, uh, tents, muskets, supplies, um, and then distributed it out. Uh, a lot of the stuff that was here uh, uh, supported the Saratoga campaign, for example. Um, and then even after the revolution was over, they continued to use it as an ordnance depot. Uh, which is why when the uh, government decided to make uh, national arms factories to support uh, the army and the militia, uh, that uh, this place was selected because there was already infrastructure here, there was already talent here, there was power supply. And so Congress passed that uh, uh, in 1794, mm -hmm. uh, which gave President Washington now, uh, his general before, now he's president, uh, the authorization to create up to four or five national arms factories, and he selected Springfield and uh, Harpers Ferry, also another national park. Well, cool. Should we walk to the other side? Yeah. And so, at its peak, how many people would have been working here? At its peak was World War II, uh, where you know they were working 24 hours a day. The plant evolved. Uh, to the point where there were about 14,000 workers here uh, working in three shifts around the clock. Um, and uh, about 42% of those were women. Mm -hmm. And then on this side of the museum, we've got the what. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's actually the, the roots of the museum collection itself. This museum was actually established in 1866, uh, more as a technical reference library for the engineers here. So once they figured out interchangeable manufacture, mm -hmm. uh, they were able to then concentrate on the firearms themselves. All sorts, you know, this is the very beginning of the American uh, Industrial Revolution. So all sorts of ideas are coming out, new materials, new practices, uh, new mechanisms, mm -hmm. things like that. And so the museum really served as a repository for all those different ideas, whether they were trying them in-house mm -hmm. or whether they were getting ideas from elsewhere, whether it was a private company or a foreign nation or what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, this became uh, the, uh, the, the technical library for the research cool. and development of Springfield Armory, and that's really how the collection grew. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the stuff on display is things that the Armory was interested in uh, in various periods. Now, the Springfield Rifle, I think, is, is probably, I mean, that's, that's you guys, right? Yep, that is absolutely. Can you show us one of those? Absolutely. Well, there's a big rack of them right here. And uh, uh, so if you had uh, been serving in the Union Army during the Civil War, chances are you would have been issued a Springfield uh, rifle musket. And uh, if you came back here during, to Springfield Armory, you would have seen these racks because uh, that's how they stored them before they got issued. Uh, and so right now there are 645 model 1861 Springfield rifle muskets in here. So, so what's the difference between a rifle and a musket? Ah, pretty much length. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so this is the, the Civil War is the very end of the musket period. That's when their soldiers were fighting in line, shoulder mm -hmm. to shoulder, and rank and file. And the musket is really designed for use in that, uh, mm -hmm. in that way. And then once they figured out that standing in one big clump is not a good idea, then uh, when they spread out, then the muskets get shorter and they just refer to them as plain rifles. And isn't it, there's the aspect also of rifling, is that right? Inside That's the absolutely true. Okay. So where the rifle distinction uh, says the internal, uh, the inside of the bore of the mm -hmm. barrel is rifled, has that lands and grooves with a spin to impart uh, ballistic spin to the uh, projectiles. Uh, the musket part of that, rifle muskets here, musket refers to the length. 
Okay. So you lose the length, then it just becomes a rifle. Okay. And you lose and a little more rank, length, then it becomes a carbine, which is interesting. Is there any actual defined length that, that uh, you know, at which one, uh, the definition changes from one to the other, or is it just kind of general? Uh, it, it just kind of okay. happens. Yeah, yeah. So, um, do you want to show us maybe, is, is there on display, like, one of the first things that was manufactured here? Sure. This is the closest one over here where we actually have kind of the evolution of the early Springfield Armory muskets. And uh, as I was saying before, with the um, scaling up of craft production, uh, really the first muskets they were making, uh, what we call today the Model 1795, because that's what they first started making in that year, is really just a copy of French muskets. So uh, going back to the revolution, a lot of the support, at least later on, came from France, uh, and a lot of those muskets that came over were still in uh, U.S. arsenals. And uh, a lot of the decision-making that went into, hey, we need to start making our own stuff, you know, this old stuff was starting to wear out. This was 20 years later. And uh, we need not only to repair the stuff, but make new ones. So really, this early one is an exact copy of a 1763-68 uh, French Charleville musket. But again, this is before we went to interchangeable parts? Is yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, they certainly had the idea. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they you know, uh, military uh, ordnance supply support was, you know, eminently frustrated with the fact that bayonets were not interchangeable. And private soldiers would lose the bayonet. <laughs> and, uh, or, you know, and a simple part breaks. And mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, they couldn't repair it right there and bring it back to an armorer, fit it specially, get it working again. So um, the idea was always there, and a lot of that was came from France as well. But, you know, you could see the utility. Wouldn't this be great if we could just repair this thing and move on? And, and so was it, um, I mean, I know we always like to think that, you know, we invented stuff. First, right. Was this the first place where there was successful volume manufacturing of interchangeable? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, um, the uh, recent scholarship is starting to make the argument that actually the Civil War um, here at Springfield Armory with making those 1861 uh, rifle muskets uh, was one of the earliest examples of mass production. You're making a complex object and you're making it completely interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and where they had interchangeable before, interchangeability since, oh, the late 1830s, early 1840s uh, here at Springfield and at Harpers Ferry, um, nothing quite put that to the test like mm -hmm. the Civil War where eventually Springfield made 800,000 So the, the volume muskets. being a, a key differentiator. Yeah, exactly. Was there some advance in technology that allowed that precision manufacturing? Uh, it wasn't necessarily an advance in technology per se, but um, it was more of a process. I mean, some people will really hear about, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Eli Whitney mm -hmm. saying, invented uh, interchangeable parts. Well, it, you know, it wasn't a one moment. It wasn't a eureka, you know, uh, guy hits his head on the toilet and yeah. comes up with a flux capacitor. But uh, um, the uh, it was really, you know, Eli Whitney was a part of it, part of that myth in a way comes from the fact that he was he took t uh, 10 pistols and basically brute forced those 10 pistols into uh, uh, being interchangeable so he was able to interchange pull them apart mm -hmm. make them into piles um, of parts and then reassemble 10 pistols what he didn't do was come up with a process and that's really what they were looking for was that was again the how mm -hmm. of you know how do we continuously make these pistols over and over again where they're all interchangeable or can we just you know we know that the mainspring let's say uh, breaks a lot can we make extra mainsprings mm -hmm. to send out to the field spare parts mm -hmm. could be a thing right. you know um, so it was really part of it was um, the machine I was standing in front of earlier, mm -hmm. which is Thomas Blanchard, uh, who started to mechanize the stock making process. It wasn't an immediate thing, but it was a step towards um, interchangeability. Once you start to mechanize the process, you get consistency. But if you notice on the Blanchard lathe, that's wood frame. So if you can almost see that in a wood in a shop with a water wheel under the floor turning, and uh, that thing's going chunka 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 chunka, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that movement is you can't get 
tight tolerances with that. So there was another guy down at Harper's Ferry Armory who was a, a John Hall, who invented the Hall rifle, which is really needed in and of itself. But the Army was more interested in the process because he said he could make them interchangeable. And the way he did that was he started using, making machines that were uh, uh, cast iron based. So he start really tightening down how much uh, uh, movement there is, how much freedom there is, and he could really get tight tolerances. So it's a little bit here, a little bit there, and then finally they refined the processes to the point where they could make something here in Springfield, uh, and this is still in Flintlock, they could make a um, Flintlock here in Springfield and then make one 450, 500 miles away in, in Harpers Ferry um, and have them be completely interchangeable. So then help us with timing just a little bit. So uh, we open at the Revolutionary War as an, uh, a, a place to safely store sure. right, armaments and so forth. At what point do you start manufacturing things? In 1794 was when Congress provided, you know, passed the legislation. Uh, Springfield Armory was manufacturing the next year. Okay, and so the 1795 is the first rifle. And or the first musket. They're sorry, not first rifles musket. yet. Yep, <laughs> first musket. And then the... The, the um, so we have the rifle musket next. Is that right? well? Basically, how it evolves, you can see uh, in early uh, uh, versions, it's the lock that evolves. It's the process of really priming or igniting the charge. So early on, it's the flint lock. If you follow it down, you see it kind of refined. You get brass parts instead of iron parts. But then down below, we get our percussion. And otherwise, it's still a smooth board. This is a model 1842. This was actually the first full model that was completely interchangeable between Harper's Ferry and Springfield, but it's percussion uh, ignition, but it's still a smooth bore. It's and that was still so that was what year? 1842. Okay. And uh, so that's where it really starts to evolve. The technology starts to change, a little There's more reliable. To several play. years that pass, yeah. right? Between. Absolutely. And then we get to rifling? And then uh, really what changed is the projectile. So instead of the round ball, mm -hmm. you get the cone-shaped uh, uh, mini ball, mm -hmm. uh, which has the function of uh, you know being able to load it quickly and then using the gas uh, from the burning powder to expand the bullet into the rifle. They had rifles, um, but part of the problem was uh, they were muzzle loaders, so in order to, to have the, uh, uh, the the ball grab that rifling, you basically had to force it backwards wow. through the rifling. It just took time. Mm -hmm. and uh, But you got accuracy. So, you know, uh, the military thinkers said, all right, we get accuracy, but we lose speed. But instead, let's go for speed and we get an accuracy. How are we going to make up for it? Well, let's make guys line up shoulder to shoulder uh, in rank and file and we'll fire volleys, play a statistic game. Uh, but there were riflemen, there were rifle, you know, skirmishers, light infantry, rifles did exist. But uh, once they got into uh, Springfield Armory arms, which means they're getting into the hands of your average infantry, line infantrymen, um, that was a change in the bullet. And so you could have rifling loaded just as fast as a smoothbore, but you got a lot more accuracy. And you get things like rear sights, because now you can pretty much aim this thing really well. Um, How's the sight when you can't really... Yeah, I mean, if you look on the earlier smoothboards, there's no rear sights. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could still do a decent job of hitting stuff, but that's not really how they were designed. Sure. sure. Um, and so now, we've still got the length. There's still muskets, mm -hmm. but now they're rifles. Mm -hmm. So now these are referred to as rifle muskets. And so this is about how long, roughly? Oh, this is eight, the first is 1855. So, sorry, in terms of physical length? Oh, physical length. They're about five feet. Okay. 60 inches. And then, so when we get to here, these are going to be that same length? Yeah, these are okay. that. Okay. And then, when do we move to something that might be more recognizable today? Well, actually, as you work your way through the, the okay. museum collection, I mean, a lot of the different ideas are coming out during the Civil War, and really, but really after the war is over, that's when the Army and the Armory has a chance to go, oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Let's think about what we're going to do. Um, one of their bigger challenges was that uh, they've got all these rifle muskets laying around. I mean, the, the Union Army went from a million down to 50,000. Um, but you've got all the arms laying around that you made for a million-man army. And so uh, part of the armory's role was to, to kind of go through and, and refurbish stuff. And actually, they were adding cool stuff to the, to the museum at the time. Um, but also, all right, how are we going to move forward? It's clearly demonstrated in the Civil War that rank and file tactics are gone. Mm -hmm. um, muzzle loaders, 
gone, how are we going to move forward? Well, we're still the government. We still, you know, <laughs> we're going to be a little cheap here. And uh, the master armorer here, Erskine Allen, was the one who came up with the idea of taking the existing uh, muskets, cutting off the rear breech, making a little door, we call it trap door today, um, that you could just simply feed in a brass cartridge rather than load, uh, in, you know, loose powder and a ball and uh, cram it down the muzzle. Um, so now you're loading from the breech um, with a combined cartridge that, you know, no longer do you have a prime, loose primer, no longer do you have loose powder. It's all in one, load it, close it up, and you're in business. And one of the big attractions to it, not only was the fact that Erskine Allen was a civil servant here, so his ideas became government property, but also he's reusing all the leftover Civil mm -hmm, War stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not buying a new design. Mm -hmm. And that also plays into uh, manufacturing. So not only that, they, they uh, um, didn't have to retool. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something a lot of people don't uh, uh, always get, is that you know to change over to the fancy Winchester lever action or something would have required a ton of training. You know, retraining all your labor, mm -hmm. retooling, making new cutters, new fixtures, new dye. I mean, it was, not only, it was not as simple as just purchasing something off the rack when you're talking about manufacturing en masse, mm -hmm. which is another attraction that uh, the government had to uh, reusing old existing stuff. It was good enough, good enough for government work. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so here we go to then these as opposed to being experimental or democracy? Yeah. yeah, and so over here is more of the experimental end. I mean, they're still being issued. They're trying in the field. Oh, and they're also trying different ideas. These ones on the left are different breach designs from other places. So not only are they considering the internal ideas, mm -hmm. they're considering external ideas as well. And, uh, um, and they ended up going forward with the external ideas, or excuse me, the internal ideas mm -hmm. um, uh, for various reasons. So this brings us up through the uh, late 1880s. Uh, where we're still using uh, one of the big things that's consistent uh, is the propellant, mm -hmm. black powder. Uh, we're using that way back in the flintlock days. They're still using it here, but they're putting them in cartridges. In 1886, France was the first country to actually uh, implement and discover uh, smokeless powder. So, you know, we're starting to advance in sciences, mm -hmm. chemistry, uh, things like that. And uh, in a lab over in France, uh, they discovered uh, a synthetic uh, explosive, really. Uh, you know, when you watch black powder go, it makes this big poof of smoke and smells like sulfur. And it's pretty much an organic compound, um, and it doesn't burn efficiently. It burns good enough uh, for use in firearms, but it doesn't burn efficiently, and that's what that big cloud is. But if you can control that in the lab and put stuff together, you can actually control the efficiency. Uh, of the powder and make it even more efficient and basically they call it smokeless because it doesn't nearly spit out as much smoke because it's an efficient burn mm -hmm. and therefore you can control the rate at which it burns mm -hmm. you get higher pressures you get more accuracy and so starting in about 1886 in Europe and then in 1892 here in the States they started moving towards smokeless mm -hmm. powder and that's when you get more powerful uh, rifles and, uh, and that's when they moved to the bolt action yeah um, so you start to get uh, experiment with actions that can withstand those higher pressures. And, uh, and how does that affect your mechanical engineering, stuff like that. And uh, uh, so not only are there massive changes in ammunition, that, uh, that there's a corresponding uh, change to rifle designs. And we ended up going with a Norwegian design. I mean, again, you know, the smokeless powder started in Europe and a lot of the advanced, early advances came out of Europe. And uh, um, these right here are the Krag Jorgensen, which was the official U.S. rifle and carbine uh, from 1892 until 1903. So this is Spanish-American War um, vintage and uh, uh, really interesting, uh, you know, kind of process by which they made those decisions. I mean, a lot of the guys were making decisions on paper, and then you put them out in the field, and they find out, well, maybe they weren't such great decisions. And that's actually one of them, where the U.S. regulars uh, carrying these crags went up against the Spanish army, uh, who were carrying Mausers. And so, uh, um, so, which were far better, far more powerful, more accurate at range, mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of advantages to it. So pretty much the Spanish Mausers were sent back here to Springfield where they said, hey guys, take a look at this stuff. And so this is the model 1903 where they took a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, features from 
the Spanish design and uh, put them into a new service rifle. So really, this is the evolution. This is Springfield Armory uh, playing around with breech design, length, even bayonets, sights, things like that. You know, the, the, the making of a rifle. And then finally, once they got the approvals and reviews and tested, um, they had their final design in 1903. Um, and so there's lots of neat stories about the 03 pretty much until uh, the modern uh, M16 battle rifle. This was the longest serving rifle. And this is commonly like, you know, you'll get a lot of, depending upon what time period you're in, you'll get a lot of uh, different answers for, show me a Springfield rifle. Well, most often when you say a Springfield, you'll think of the 1903. And uh, so this is through World War I and even into World War II. Um, and uh, so instead of individual load, we're talking multiple. There's five round magazines. They're able to shoot a little faster, but it's all manually operated, um, which is uh, pretty much the standard all around the world at the time. And through World War I. And so, World War I here. Yeah. And still there's neat ideas coming out that are reflective of what's happening currently. Mm -hmm. And so you get in here, you get uh, people who are uh, um, saying, hey, you know, uh, our, our doughboys are fighting in trenches. And how do we reduce uh, uh, casualties? Can we create a, something that enables them to, to fire mm. without exposing themselves? So, you know, neat idea on paper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and so these are here because they were tried out. They, you know, this is the place to try out new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, these never win any. Um, but uh, but interesting and reflective of, of you know people trying to respond to what's happening mm -hmm. on the ground at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the next evolution from there. Yeah, I mean quickly we kind of go through foreign arms. Um, you know uh, things other countries are using again. Yeah. You see kind of more of the same goal. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, really what happens over here is uh, just after World War One. Springfield Armory, well, the Ordnance Department, the Army Ordnance Department says, all right, what's what's coming after manually operated bolt actions? Well, that's a design that can cycle itself. I mean, there were machine guns, big, heavy machine guns, um, but they wanted to figure out something that could be carried by an individual soldier that had that same function for a military cartridge. So in 1919, they hired a guy named John Garan um, and uh, basically gave him the assignment of create a semi-automatic rifle. Was, were there semi-automatic rifles in production elsewhere? To a degree, they were mostly in the civilian market, mm -hmm. um, which was a lot of kind of lower powered cartridges um, and uh, nothing that would, uh, that the Ordnance Department considered military mm -hmm. grade mm -hmm. in a way. And part of that was ruggedness you know, you want something that can take a little abuse mm -hmm. um, in addition to uh, uh, firing uh, a military cartridge. And so uh, that was the goal, create something rugged, something that can get beat up, something that will still function, and something that will fire a, a military cartridge, in, in this case, the 30-06, which is the same ammo that the earlier uh, 1903 uh, fired. And so uh, you can see John Garand's kind of evolution here. There's a lot of really technical, nerdy things we could get into on, on how it evolved. But basically, by 1936, so 1919 is up here, and then 17 years later, we're finally at a final product, uh, which is another interesting aspect of R&D, testing, failure, back and forth, getting stuff out to the field, getting a lot of input, making changes. And not only uh, are they um, trying to figure out um, the rifle itself, but the other challenge is they're also trying to figure out how to produce it en masse. So they're also figuring out the tooling and the, the operations, and this is where uh, scientific management starts coming in, where you don't just have machinery randomly scattered about, you, there's a flow. Um, and they started building buildings shortly after Germany invaded uh, uh, most of Europe. And uh, uh, the wheels started turning here, even though we weren't at war. And they started making big factory floors with lots of space that they could really organize and make the most efficient, uh, uh, basically, manufacturing line uh, here because they, they could see what was coming. And as a result, when we finally did go to war, 
Um, the, uh, uh, the rapidly expanding U.S. Army had the most advanced battle rifle in its hands, uh, and that was the M1 Garand rifle, uh, as you see here. Six million pieces. Yep. Yeah, this was the standard uh, U.S. infantry arm through 1957. Really? And so it served for quite a while. And of course, semi automatic means every time you pull the trigger, it will fire, cycle, eject the empty shell, load a new one ready for you to pull the trigger again. So it stops. And so the next logical step after that, and actually they started working on it before World War II was over, was to give me something that has select fire. Let me choose between semi-auto or full auto um, that is uh, carryable by an individual infantryman. And so that was basically post-World War II Springfield Armory where they tried out lighter ideas um, that had this select fire capability. Uh, and you can see some of these are direct descendants of the M1. Some are completely new ideas, and uh, uh, they ended up going with uh, almost the descendant of the M1, which is the M14, um, which was adopted in 1957 and uh, served until basically uh, 1968 or so when they adopted the M16. And these are here because this was testing. But interestingly, this is also the end of Springfield Armory. So post-World War, you know, if you contrast the end of Springfield Armory with the beginning, the beginning, no factories. There's nobody else who can do it. There's no nothing with the, where, with the resources of government to be able to start a massive factory. Post-World War II, that's not the case. There's plenty of private companies, and at least that was the, uh, the, the rationale of the Defense Department to say, hey, we really don't need to have government manufacture anymore. Uh, we can just move the, uh, um, the R&D function elsewhere and shut down the factory. And that's basically what they did while they, and the M16, the AR-15 really reinforced that to say, hey, a private company can do all the work that was traditionally done by Springfield Armory. Is, is there the last rifle here on display? You know, there's not. <laughs> there's a few, that, there's some of the firsts okay. uh, for the models. Uh, they but probably they, never thought they, that at the time, right? Yeah, they didn't, I don't know if they thought about it. Uh, it may have just gone out the door. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. The museum is open when, generally throughout the season, open all year, right? It's open all year from November until basically the winter and spring, November till uh, uh, Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. We close on Mondays and Tuesdays. Okay. Okay. But in general, when we're open, it's 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay. Right. Um, so now this was the lathe you were referring to, right? Yeah. Made, out, made so, out of wood. This is one of our. This is one of the crown jewels of the collection. Uh, this is a critically important machine in the history of American industry. Um, one of the neat things that the Ordnance Department did and the U.S. Army did was subsidize inventors. Say, hey, you've got a great idea. Let's we'll make. We've got space for you, mm -hmm. um, an incubator, if you will, to develop your ideas. And so one guy named Thomas Blanchard, who was from a little further east in Massachusetts, said, hey, I got an idea for stock manufacturing. He had other patents and said, I can do that for stocks. And so the Ordnance Department said, all right, we'll set you up at Springfield Armory. We want you to make machines for stock making, which would, again, was traditionally done all by hand, all by woodworkers, craftsmen, very talented craftsmen. Uh, and, uh, but Thomas Blanchard had a way to really simplify that. And so uh, he actually had, or, oh, seven or eight machines uh, that did various uh, uh, tasks. This is the first, uh, you know, aside from one guy just sitting there and making a stock, this is the first time you start breaking down jobs by operation, you know, and uh, you start to get a little more granular in what happens um, because uh, machines are very, you know, one task or a few tasks. And so out of those eight machines, the most revolutionary uh, was uh, this one. And this is uh, Blanchard's uh, half-stocking machine, or we just call it Blanchard's lathe. And uh, uh, basically, this is the first machine that was able to duplicate irregular shapes. Is there a, this model over here? There is, this? and a great instance of, of how it worked. So we hit the button here, and if you see, so there would be a stock blank on the back side. 
and a blade, a cutter blade, and basically there's a whole cradle here um, uh, mounted. And then on the closer end is uh, an iron pad. So that's what you're duplicating. And then as the follower wheel follows that iron pad, the cutter makes a corresponding cut on the stock line. And so instead of, you know, on a traditional lathe, which existed for a while, you'd, you'd have to make things with a, a, a concentric uh, center. And uh, you know things like broomsticks or baseball bats or um, candlesticks or what have you. Uh, but here you could make something um, that wasn't concentric, something that had an odd shape. Um, in addition to musket stocks, you do axe handles and shoe lasts and uh, oddball stuff like that. So, so um, this right here closest is the pattern, right? Correct. And then here in the back, we're milling the stock, right? Yep. Yeah, and that's another thing. You've got the name lathe, which kind of stuck, but technically it's, it's kind of a hybrid milling machine lathe. <laughs> but uh, this was installed uh, down at the water shops in about 1822, maybe a little earlier. And, uh, which was completely new. Nothing had ever been seen like it in the world. How many, what, what was the production volume you could You know, that's, that's a good question. Um, and in fact, that's a kind of a matter of debate, but, but roughly the idea was you could um, do maybe about six times as much as you could by hand, mm -hmm. probably more. Um, but again, this is only one little step and a bunch of steps and um, the, the importance here wasn't necessarily a volume, it was the consistency. Mm -hmm. It was the, um, that, that step towards mechanization um, that was really critical as opposed to a wonder machine that all of a sudden quadrupled your volume. And so we go from wooden frames to? To metal frames. And actually you can see this as a uh, second generation Blanchard lathe, um, which uh, uh, you can actually see the follower wheel in the back where there would be another kind of iron pattern. And then the cutter is towards us mm -hmm. um, where, you know, they've made it a lot more efficient. But again, here's your metal frame. It's nice and tight. It's not going to move around um, when you're powering it. <clears throat> and then the, the wheels here would go to what? Uh, some central power source. Correct? That's right. And early on it was water. And then later on, uh, probably, oh, 1840s or, 18, or so, it was uh, steam. Okay. Uh, and then finally electricity. Okay. And you can see some of the old belt-powered machines. They continued to use them because uh, they just oh. popped an uh, electric motor onto this. And uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And then this... Oh, there's a bunch of neat kind of ancillary machines. This is a, um, a basically a chronoscope, um, which they use to help uh, uh, determine velocity. And so this was a neat, this contraption that, uh, you know, how do you measure the speed of bullets? Okay, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Well, this is, this is great. Um, barrel straightening, huh? This is fascinating. So, when they were at peak production for, say, World War II, do you, need, do you know roughly how many people were, would have been here? Yeah, uh, so uh, World War II was about 14,000. Okay. And then, but in, in considering volume, let me contrast it with the earlier years. Uh, very early on, you know, there were uh, about 200 uh, workers here um, making roughly, you know, uh, 200 to 1,000 muskets a year. Okay, um, so we go from 200 then to 14,000 at World War II. Right, okay. and, but this is, that's 150 years difference. Yeah, sure. Um, but the interesting thing is, I mean, one of the reasons why it's hard to measure the impact of Blanchard's lathe immediately was there was no demand for the volume. Wow. And uh, so you really weren't pushed to the limit necessarily. You had your quotas and you had, all right, we need such and such amount of muskets just to replace the ones that are wearing out or what have you. Um, there was nothing like a full-blown war that really pushed it to the limit. And by the time it hit that with the Civil War, uh, that the Blanchard lathe was off the line and into the museum already. 
Uh, so, uh, but its its descendants were definitely there as part of the process, and that's the point where there were more than six thousand working here, and they were cranking out about a thousand per day. So six thousand during the Civil War. Yeah, and a uh, thousand muskets, a uh, thousand completely interchangeable rifle muskets a day. per day, which is stunning. Uh, and they weren't able to really work at night. One of those, one of the challenges, oh. they didn't have a good light source. Right. They had gas, but it didn't, didn't quite work. Um, but by World War II, uh, they did. They had one of the first fluorescent light, lighted uh, buildings in the country was right here at Springfield Armory, and that enabled them to have daylight 24 hours a day. So they had full production around the clock, and that's where you get 14,000. Uh, and then they were making, at its peak, it was about 200 M1 rifles per hour. And uh, in January alone, January of 43, I believe, uh, they were up over 120,000 rifles that month alone, 200 an hour. It's amazing. Wow. amazing. And more complex piece, a lot more parts, a lot more fine manufacturing. And, uh, uh, but they're cranking it out. It's sure. definitely the peak of Springfield Armory. Excellent. Say, Alex, thanks so much for taking us through the Springfield Armory. Oh, you're welcome.